A very good morning. I would like I would like to wish to Sir Dean and my fellow friends. Today we are here to discuss about introduction to genetic engineering and the tools used in genetic engineering. So my group members will be Amos, Boon, Davigan, and Chen Wei. So first of all, we will be talking about the history of genetic engineering. So the genetic engineering is term used to describe the purposeful changes in DNA. Genetic engineering relies on the production of recombinant DNA. So what is actually recombinant DNA? Recombinant DNA refers to any piece of DNA that has been changed around. It gets its name uh, because DNA pieces have been recombined into new sequences. Recombinant DNA can be made from samples from the same species or different species. Traditionally, humans have manipulated genomes indirectly by controlling breeding and selecting offsprings with desired traits. Genetic engineering involves the direct manipulation of one or more genes. Most often, a gene from another species is added to an organism's genome to give it a desired phenotype. So we'll be talking about the scientists. So the first scientist I'll be talking about is Herbert Boyer. So Herbert Boyer studied about the restriction enzymes. So these are the proteins that cut DNA at specific sequence. The enzyme leaf overhanging end, which, is, which can be used to attach the DNA to another piece of complementary end. And moving on to Stanley Cohen. Stanley Cohen studied about the plasmids. So plasmids are small pieces in DNA that bacteria use to transfer information. So there are other scientists also such as James Watson and Francis Crick showed that DNA molecule has a double helix structure. And also Alfred Hershey and Martha Chase who discovered that DNA is the genetic, engineering, uh, genetic material in our body by using blender experiment. Uh, next slide. So these are the scientists, Herbert Boyer, Alfred Hershey, Stanley Cohen, Martha Chase, Jim Watson, and Francis Crick. So that's all for me. Thank you very much. So, um, okay, uh, now I'm going to explain the stages involved in genetic engineering. So um, the first stages is, um, the first stages is the DNA cleavage. So at this stage, we're going to extract the DNA from the cell, from the donor cell. And then second is the recombinant DNA production. So, um, okay, imagine you extract the DNA. Okay, imagine this is the DNA. Can see? And you extract the DNA from a cell. Okay. So um, as we all know, um, there's certain genes that encode for certain proteins. So, okay, let's say lah, we need these genes for our cloning. We need these genes. So, we're going to cut this gene out. So, we're going to use the restriction enzyme. So, um, restriction enzyme is like a scissor. The function of restriction um, enzyme is to cut this specific gene from the DNA. So, um, okay, after we get this gene, uh, I mean, not only this DNA, it will cut the whole DNA cut, 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 cut into small pieces, uh, many, many pieces. And then we're going to mix this with a plasmid. So this is the plasmid, the structure of the plasmid, circular and double-stranded DNA. So um, uh, we want this gene to attach on the plasmid. So how are we going to do it? So same, we're going to use the restriction enzyme. This restriction enzyme will cut here. Okay, there will be like a hole here. So the gene, the gene will come and bind here. Like here. And then it will become like this. So what make it stick together? The DNA ligase, you remember from our syllabus? So the DNA ligase will um, join them together. So here is the structure of the um, plasmid lah. And the genes. So um uh, okay. Um okay, so here is the genes that we're going to use. So after that, we're going to introduce to the host. Okay, I mean the next stage, we're going to introduce these plasmid to host. So um in Bowyer's and Cohen's experiment, 
they use the E. coli as a host. So imagine this is the E. coli. Imagine this is the E. coli. And then, um, imagine this is the E. coli. We want this thing to penetrate inside the E. coli so that they can grow inside. They need host to grow. Lah. So how are we going to penetrate this inside this? So uh, in Bowyer's and Cohen experiment, they, um, they cool down the cells and then quickly heat the E. coli. So at this process, it will create hole at the E. coli's membrane. Okay, this E. coli and then this, okay, imagine this is the membrane. When you cold it down and then you heat it suddenly, it will create hole. So with that hole, this plasmid will penetrate inside the um, E. coli. Okay. And then, as I mentioned before, right? Uh, no, I never mentioned. So, uh, this, I mean, if the plasmid got the genes, got the genes, right? It's um, the useful one. We, we need this one. But then some code, right? They don't attach to plasmid. So, the plasmid is like a blank plasmid. So, this one is the useless one. Lah. So, in, in that tube, can we mix all everything in a tube? So, imagine there's two types. Imagine there's... Um, e. coli and then this is the useless one and this is the useful one how are we going to like differentiate these two so um we okay we're going to use a gel box also uh yes we're going to use a gel box and use a technique called gel electrophoresis so at this process it will separate the E. coli with a useful plasmid and one E. coli with the um, useless one. So we're going to put it in, okay, I mean before, sorry, I skip one stage. Before you put the gel, we're going to, uh, we're going to put the E. coli inside a tetracycline. So tetracycline is a type of antibiotic, means that it will kill the E. coli, but it won't kill this thing. This thing, I mean, when uh, when you put the tetracycline, right? When you put this whole thing, this E. coli and this thing inside a tetracycline, it will kill the E. coli. So E. coli will die. So they won't grow. But then this plasmid, they will continue growing. So after you put tetracycline, and then you put in a incubator, and then you, I mean, you put in a incubator for one day, one night, one day, and then the next day you take out, and then yes you have like a lot of genes. Yeah, I think that's all from me. Thank you. So the next one is restriction endonucleases. So restriction endonucleases are also known as restriction enzyme. These endonucleases are enzymes that cleave the phosphodiester bond within a polynucleotide chain. So this endonucleus are found in bacteria and it is used as defense tool in them. This is because the enzyme is used to cut the viral DNA injected into the bacteria. So it is known as their natural defenses. There are many types of restriction endonucleases extracted from various types of bacteria. So these restriction endonucleases are named of the bacteria which produce it. So restriction enzymes are basically is known as DNA cutting enzymes. This enzyme recognizes a specific base sequence in the DNA and call and it is called recognize, recognition sequence and it will cleave at that site. It recognizes one or few target sequence and cut the DNA at those sequence or near those sequence and this will produce a discrete DNA fragment. Many, res many restriction enzymes make target cut and producing ends with single stranded DNA over overhangs and however some produce bunhangs. So each enzyme have a specific type or specific sorry specific manner of cutting the enzymes 
So they are two type of manner, which is the first one is sticky end and the second one is blunt end. So next slide. So this is the diagram of sticky end. So sticky end leaves overhang strength, which is in direction of five prime or three prime overhangs. So this sticky end DNA sequence can be used to rejoin the fragments of the DNA, but there will be a gap remain between the those two DNA fragments. So next one. So this is the blunt end. So blunt end is basically the enzyme which cut straight the DNA sequence, and this will cut the cut the end to DNA sequence to separate the separate the DNA sequence equally. So next. So this is the next enzyme. The next enzyme is DNA ligase. DNA ligase is a DNA joining enzyme. It facilitates the joining of DNA strand together by catalyzing the formation of a phosphodiester bond. If two types of DNA have matching ends, the ligase can link them to form a single unbroken molecule of DNA. So basically the DNA ligase seals the gap between the those molecules and it forms a single piece of DNA. So this is the diagram of DNA ligase. So that's all from me. Thank you. The next enzyme is the alkaline phosphate, which is used to prevent the unwanted cell ligation of the vector DNA when the cloning process is occur. How to prevent the cell ligation by removing the phosphate group from 5 prime end of a DNA and leaving a free prime hydroxyl group? As you can see from the diagram below, which is the 5 prime phosphate is removed and leaving a free hydroxyl group by the end of alkaline phosphatase. Next slide. Next slide. Now I'll talk about the cloning process. As you can see from the diagram below, the first is the plasmic is cut and open. Okay. And it got the phosphate group and also hydroxyl group. Okay. After that, if you start adding the DNA ligase, the recirculation of the plasmic will occur. But if you're adding the alkaline phosphatase, the 5 prime phosphate will be removed and leaving the 5 prime hydroxyl. The 2 2 can become the hydroxyl group already. If you add this state, you direct adding the DNA ligase, it's not relation will occur because the 2 2 is the hydroxyl uh, group. They cannot combine. Okay, now we must adding the ligase with two types of DNA. We've got the phosphate group, then they will recombine and the ligation will occur. Okay, next. Next slide. Okay, okay. Next and then is reverse transcription. As you know, we learned before the previous chapter is talking about the transcription, which is convert the DNA to RNA. But now we learn about the reverse transcription, the new thing, which is convert the RNA to DNA to produce the single stranded DNA. We also call this DNA as cDNA, which is the copy DNA or complementary DNA by using the mRNA as the template. First, first diagram, you all can see okay, the general for the process for the reverse transcription. For DNA polymerase, it's used to DNA replication 
for the RNA polymerase is used to convert the DNA to RNA, which is the transcription process. The next one is last, lastly the reverse transcription and use the is used to convert the RNA to DNA by the enzyme reverse transcriptase. Okay, for the the set diagram is the process for the reverse transcription. Okay, you see the third one when the primer is attached and the DNTPS, which is the deoxic nucleotide transporphate, will come. And after that, the reverse transcriptase is bind to the primer and will build the DNA strand by adding the nucleotide. And the DNA strand will be synthesized. Okay. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, thanks. Okay, for the next, the enzyme is DNA polymerase, which is used to catalyze the formation of polynucleotide chain by editing the nucleotide. Okay, it will only take place when the presence of appropriate DNA template. Okay, DNA polymerase are the template direct enzyme. It will add the nucleotide at the three prime end of the primer in polynucleotide chain. So the DNA, the DNA polymerase will add a nucleotide. To start the reaction, DNA polymerase need the primer with free three prime hydroxyl group, and they cannot start from scratch by adding nucleotide to a free single stranded DNA template. However, RNA polymerase, uh, this one is extra information for RNA polymerase. It used to initial. RNA synthesis without primer. Next slide. Okay. Okay. We have three types of polymerase, which is DNA dependent DNA polymerase, the copy DNA into DNA. For the second one is DNA dependent DNA polymerase, which is the copy RNA into DNA. For the last one is DNA dependent RNA polymerase, is to transcribe the DNA into RNA, which occur in the transcription okay for the diagram it's talking about the dna polymerase the, the process when it occurred okay for the, uh, okay first one the dna will be separated to two and the primer will attach okay then the dna polymerase for the last uh, last stage is they will extend the nucleotide chains become two copy okay that's all from me okay they will continue to the vectors, okay. So, okay, uh, next I'll proceed with the vector. So, uh, what is vector? Vector is actually uh, known as a carrier or transfer, transporter that transfers or inserts foreign gene into another cell, which is uh, called as host cell. So, uh, for vectors, right, uh, it, it should be able to self uh, do self-replication and also uh, should be able to isolate themselves because uh, for, uh, from the whole cell. This is because uh, the size of the vectors should be small. Okay, and then uh, there are a few things that we, we need to consider before choosing vectors. So the first one is actually uh, the DNA insert size and then the size of the vectors and then the restriction site and also the efficiency of cloning by each vector. So there are a few uh, characteristics of vectors. And the first one is the origin of replication, or also known as ORI. And then uh, the, it should have a restriction site, and also small in size, and also have selectable marker. So what is uh, origin of replication? So origin of replication is actually a specific sequence uh, in, in a gene where the replication is actually started or initiated. Okay, and then the restriction site. So a restriction site is actually a sequence in DNA that can be uh, recognized and cut by the restriction enzymes. And then the selectable markers actually uh, refer to the gene that is introduced into a cell like uh, bacteria that has a suitable trait for the artificial selection. Okay, next.
Okay, uh, there are actually a uh, few types of vectors, but I'll be focusing on the main four types. And the first one is actually plasmid. So plasmid is actually uh, can be found in many uh, bacteria and also eukaryotes. So uh, for plasmids, right, plasmids is actually the first vector that is used in gene cloning. Okay, and it is the most common type of vector. And then uh, the plasmid, uh, the DNA that can be insert up to plasmid is actually up to 10 KB and KB is actually refers to the kilobase and then uh, the advantage of plasmid is that it can have high uh, copy number like 500 to 700 per cell and then uh, plasmid also can uh, easily manipulate and isolate from the host cell because they actually are small in size and then uh, plasmid also are actually more stable because of the circular configuration of the plasmid and then but the disadvantage of plasmid is that the plasmid will only encode uh, proteins which are important for their own replication in the host cell okay uh, next so cosmid this is the second type of factor cosmid is actually uh, also same as plasmid but the thing is that uh, cosmic contains a lambda phase at the cos sequence. And then the cos site is also known as cosy site. Uh, also actually are called as restriction site, which is uh, actually important for inserting exogenous DNA into the host cell. Okay, and then uh, the DNA sequence in the cosmic are actually the lambda phase, which is actually packed efficiently by the cos site. The advantage of cosmid compared to other vectors is that it has a high transformation efficiency and also are capable of producing large number of clones in the host cell. Next. So the third uh, type of vector is that uh, viral vector. So this vector is actually the most common tools or vector that is used in uh, delivering genetic materials into cells. So uh, the, this process is also known as, uh, this process can be performed in uh, inside living organisms like in vivo or in culture, which is uh, called as in vitro. So a viral vector actually targets the central nervous system and the effect is actually uh, stable for a long time of period. Okay, and then the last is the artificial chromosomes. Under artificial chromosomes, there actually are three types of artificial chromosomes. The first one is the bacterial artificial chromosome. Second is human artificial chromosome. And the third one is yeast artificial chromosome. So for the first one, the, which is the bacterial, are uh, actually are similar to E. coli plasmid vector. The advantage is that uh, this artificial chromosome can fit large sequence without any risk of rearrangement for his uh, artificial chromosome the large dna can insert up to 200 kb kilobase at the clone i mean at the host cell and then uh, the the last one is the human artificial chromosome so for this uh, they actually artificially synthesized and uh, the advantage is that uh, there's no limit uh, on DNA that can be cloned by this vector. So uh, the first assembled in is budding yeast and uh, several attempts are actually done on mammals. So uh, that's all from us. Thank you.